Hello, hello and, and welcome uh, to this uh, IIEA hybrid event. Um, I'm delighted to say we have a great turnout here in North Great Georgia Street, and we're also uh, live streaming. Um, we're delighted to have with us today Tony Connolly, who needs no introduction. He's the Europe editor for RTE, though that won't stop me from giving a brief introduction in a few minutes, uh, who has taken time out from his extremely busy schedule because not only is he you know, the, the oracle on all things Brexit, but he's also now heavily engaged on reporting from Ukraine. Um, and of course, we're here to talk about the, 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 the evolving situation in the United Kingdom with a, a, a new prime minister, a new, new lineup of ministers, uh, and of course, uh, the prospects which this has for uh, Northern Ireland, for the protocol discussions, for Anglo-Irish relations, for relations between the, the UK and the European Union. Uh, Tony will talk for about 20 minutes in our usual format, and then we'll go and take question and answers, both from the from the audience uh, and from uh, people uh, uh, on online. Uh, for those of you here in the room, I'm told to tell you raise your hand. I think we can we can manage that, right? That's uh, not a very advanced technology. Uh, and for those of you online, you use the by now painfully familiar Q and A function on Zoom, uh, uh, which you will see on your screen, and you can. Send in your questions throughout the discussion, and we will we will pick them up uh, when we get to the audience uh, involvement part of the uh, event. Um, and uh, both people online and people here in North Great Georgia Street can uh, participate in the discussion on Twitter uh, using the handle at IIEA. And if they paid their eight dollars for the blue tick uh, in, in accordance with the new arrangements, uh, and I should remind you that today's presentation and the Q&A are all on the record. So just a few words about Tony. Um, he, he, of course, he's the Europe editor for RTE. He hails from Derry. Uh, he has reported extensively on Brexit. I can tell you, when I was in Washington, uh, a colleague from the British Embassy said to me once, there's only one person worth following on, on Brexit, and that's that guy Tony Connolly from RTE. So I knew then that uh, Tony's coverage had definitely arrived as the definitive uh, verdict. Um, he <laughs> exactly. Um, he's been covering European affairs since 2001. And of course, most recently, we've seen him covering the, the invasion of Ukraine. And he was actually in Ukraine on, on the day of uh, the invasion. He's the recipient of a number of awards, two ESP National Media Awards, a European Journalism Award, and a New York Festivals Radio Award. He was also awarded the Outstanding Achievement in Journalism Award by the UCD Smurfit Graduate School and at the Irish Law Society Award for his coverage of the Brexit negotiations. It, my notes say he's the author of Brexit in Ireland, but I know he's also the author of another excellent book, which is uh, Don't Talk About the War, which I know was produced in two editions because I have one of each, which I think Tony Connolly brought to me uh, uh, each time. Uh, but, uh, and he's married with, with three children and, and he lives in Brussels. And of course, we're delighted to welcome you here, Tony. Thanks a lot for taking the time. We, we look forward to hearing your thoughts on, on what's happening. Thank you very much, David. Uh, great to be back in the IIEA. Thanks to Dara and Barry as well for, for making this happen. Um, the last time I was here, I think Theresa May was the Prime Minister. So, yeah, so we, we have five Prime Ministers in six years, and, and we're still essentially dealing with some of the same issues. Um, but I, I, I would like to just reflect a bit on what the arrival of Rishi Sunak means to the Brexit process and, and the relations between Ireland and the UK and the UK and the European Union and and to try and bring things up up to up to date. I mean there's obviously a lot of things happening in various quarters in, in London and in Belfast and, and in Brussels. Um we uh we we've obviously seen a tremendous amount of upheaval and churn within the British political system, a lot of instability, which can really be traced back to the events of, of June 2016. Um, and I think it's fair to say that people now see Rishi Sunak as drawing a, a thick line under a period of populism and ushering in a new sobriety into British politics. Um, but I, th I think we really have to question 
how true that is because he hasn't really been tested yet on the issues around Ireland, the Northern Ireland Protocol, the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill. Uh, I'm told that he has only ever once been on the island of Ireland, and that was during the Conservative Party hustings uh, in Northern Ireland during the summer. Compared to Liz Truss, who's actually been at a hen party in Cork. So in terms of credibility, um, I think uh, Liz Truss wins hands down in terms of understanding the Irish uh, situation. But I think... Overall, if we step back and look at the past six years, you know, we've had five prime ministers, Cameron, May, Johnson, Truss, and now Sunak. And we can trace all the problems back to the fact that Brexit wasn't really properly prepared for or understood. People in the UK system didn't fully understand or anticipate the Irish question. And then in the crucible of the negotiations from 2017 all the way up to 2019, it seems that in, in the vacuum of the system in the UK, not fully comprehending what people had voted for and what, what they voted for would mean in terms of relations with the European Union and what kind of Brexit would, would they would end up with, into that vacuum stepped uh, the, the right wing of the Conservative Party. And, and that grip has not really been loosened um, and we have had these spasms of really almost violent upheaval within the Conservative Party that everyone is kind of hostage to and, uh, and, and also a spectator to. And, you know, we, we are back now with uh, yet another prime minister. Um, I mean, Rishi Sunak is known as a, a true believer. He's, he was a Brexiteer from the get-go, but he doesn't have any, as I say, real experience of Ireland or insight into it. Now, I know that he had he has had dealings with Pascal Donoghue. That seems to be a, a fairly good relationship. Um, but his background would not lend you to lend any major credibility to the idea that he would have a nuanced and instinctive grasp of the complexities of of Ireland and the and the Irish question, um, what what we've had in that vacuum, as I say, over the past number of years, is almost like a hammer and anvil scenario, uh, whereby you could only really lay claim to being a true Brexiteer if you fulfilled certain uh, criteria, if you had certain expectations, if you had an unblemished past, um, and and this has led to you know, a really chronic misunderstandings and a breakdown in communication between Brussels and London and London and Dublin. And, you know, we're, we're still really recovering from that. Um, what we can say, going back to Theresa May's time, is that she voted Remain, but then she obviously had to assert her Brexit credentials when she became Prime Minister. We had that famous Tory party conference speech, which was pure boosterism about how great Britain would be with Brexit. Uh, Brexit means Brexit, and we're going to make a, a, a success of it. Um, but yet, at the same time, Theresa May understood the trade-offs between Brexit and the British economy still having access to supply chains, and, and an integrated relationship with the European market. And she also understood, I think, through a, a very painful process of the, the joint report and the negotiations with Brussels and, and Dublin, she understood that if you were to avoid damaging the union, then there would have to be compromises at, at the level of the Conservative Party and, and at, you know, in, in terms of the, the Brexit true believers. In a sense, Theresa May placed the union of Great Britain and Northern Ireland ahead of global Britain. And that was why, in a very tortured and ultimately doomed to fail uh, bid, she went for this um, UK-wide customs union with the European Union. Uh, that would avoid a customs border on the Irish Sea. And just to remind people of what was involved there, it would it would be... 
that you would have this interim customs union between the UK and the EU, avoiding a customs border on the Irish Sea. And then the free trade agreement with the UK, between the UK and the EU, would be so close that you wouldn't need to have a border on the island of Ireland. Um, and remember the backstop, the famous backstop was like the third option. It was a, it was what we, you know, there are so many names to it, but they called it the safety net. So if the free trade agreement wasn't as free and close uh, as possible, then the backstop would kick in. But she was a believer in a close trading relationship with the EU because during all of this period, we're talking uh, 2017, 2018, you know, there, there were automotive companies beating a path to Downing Street saying we need to be part of the single market in some shape or form. And you could see that she didn't really have fully formed ideas about what the relationship should be. She talked about some kind of associate membership of the of the customs union. And that actually at the time kept Irish government hopes alive that whereas she had said in her Tory party speech about Brexit meaning Brexit, um, that somehow she would tilt back towards some closer relationship with the single market, even though if it wasn't fully formed in her mind, and even though the European Union were saying, well, you can't, you can't have some kind of associate member membership of the customs union, that simply doesn't work. Um, and then eventually, through a very painful process, she pushed for this UK-wide customs arrangement. I mean, the EU was really res resisting going down that road. And then once they did have it in the, in the body of the, of the treaty in 2018, where it would have legal force, then that's when member states were going, well, hang on a second, if we're going to give the UK access to the customs union, then we need a level playing field. So all the stuff about the level playing field from the trade and cooperation agreement actually predates that. It goes back to when the UK wanted the, um, the UK-wide customs union. And of course, we know what happens. That was then seized on by the Brexiteers and the Conservative Party uh, and, and the DUP, let's not forget, uh, as a betrayal of Brexit. And she ended up paying a very heavy, heavy price. It was rejected three times in the House of Commons. Uh, she was booted out and then Boris Johnson came in and he came in on a blaze of glory and promising to rip up the backstop. And uh, he then ended up in the world in Thornton Manor Hotel with Leo Varadkar, completely selling out his long-held principles and, and pledges during the election campaign to be Tory leader. And, and he ended up with what essentially we have today, which is the, the protocol as is. Um, and again, this is part of the problem of Brexit is that, is that the people who are given the power to manage the negotiations and manage the relationship don't really know in detail about how the EU works or how the customs union works. There was a famous meeting between Boris Johnson and Michel Barnier and Jean-Claude Juncker in Luxembourg. And he was kind of sat down in the room and explained to, uh, it was Stephanie Rizzo, who was a senior official in Barnier's team, who sat him down and explained to him the principles of the customs union and single market. And this was in 2019. Um, you know, even three years after the Brexit vote, he still didn't really understand them. So, so that was, a, again, a function of why we've had this instability and problem, uh, problems uh, in, in the whole evolution of the Brexit process. Um, Boris Johnson signed up to the protocol. We, we all know that. The big part of that trade-off was he had come in saying, we're going to have a, okay, we're going to have a all-island single market for animal food uh, and agri-food and so on, a, an epidemiological single unit, which we kind of have uh, at the moment, um, or, or we, we've had historically. Um, but we're going to have a customs border or back from the land border, uh, and it's going to be high tech. And he had the whole alternative arrangements thing going on where they would find, they would have drones, or um, at one point they were looking at facial recognition for sheep. I kid you not. Um, they they had they had a they had a government appointed alternative arrangements operation up and running. They had a privately funded alternative arrangements thing up and running, but in the end, uh, he of course had this pivotal phone call with Angela Merkel, and she was saying we are not having a customs border on the island of Ireland, and that's kind of final. Uh, that was the famous phone call that was 
leaked by Dominic Cummings. Um, and so then he, he agreed to a customs border and a regulatory border on the Irish Sea. And in exchange, Leo Varadkar agreed to a, a consent mechanism, uh, which wasn't there before. Now, in the negotiations, the DUP had demanded that they get the consent mechanism before the treaty was concluded. And the EU were not going to buy that, even though Boris Johnson put it forward in the negotiations. Um, what they agreed to and what Leo Varadkar agreed to in the end was a consent mechanism that would happen four years after the protocol comes into effect. And if it if it got a particular form of consent, then um, you would have another vote uh, four years later. But if it got a, an even bigger form of consent, then there wouldn't be another vote in the in the assembly for another eight years. Um, so so and this was also a kind of a time limit. You might recall that at the, at the back back then, the, a lot of conservative ministers were saying we need a time limit to uh, any arrangement around a protocol. Uh, in a sense, if you have a a you know a rendezvous at Stormont where you can have a consent vote, then that's kind of a time limit. Uh, because you could say, well, if people don't want it, then it, it, the arrangements will have to be replaced, or most of the arrangements will have to be replaced. So that was how things uh, kind of panned out. And then in, um, in January 2021, the protocol took effect. And David Frost, of course, was the, the main protocol negotiator. Uh, sorry, he wasn't, it was Michael Gove at that time. Um, but I think history will find a very, very key pivotal moment. And, and David will recall this as well, probably intimately, the, the events on the 29th of January 2021, because that was when the famous uh, so-called triggering of Article 16 by the European Commission happened. Um, I remember I was, I was traveling to Rome that day and I when I turned my phone on, when I landed, it just nearly melted because there were like thousands of, of text messages and calls. And essentially what had happened was that there was a big concern in the European Commission that AstraZeneca uh, vaccine doses were, were being gobbled up by the UK uh, when they should have gone to the EU. And of course, the EU was struggling to keep up with the vaccination process of, of the UK. And what they did was they handed over the handling of vaccination exports to Dombrovskis, Valdis Dombrovskis and DG Trade to, to make it not a health issue, but a, a trade issue. Uh, he was apparently very miffed uh, at this. Um, but what they agreed was that if, if doses that were being manufactured in, on, in the European Union were being exported out of the EU, then they would have to have an export certificate. Um, whereas if they were just being exported to another member state, they wouldn't need to have that certificate. Um, somebody in DG uh, Taxud identified a loophole. Ah, we've got this Northern Ireland protocol, which means Northern Ireland is regarded as part of the single market. Therefore, uh, doses can flow straight to Northern Ireland, but there can't be any, there has to be unfettered movement of goods from Northern Ireland into Great Britain. So that, that you could end up having vaccine doses channeled through Northern Ireland into Great Britain. I mean, it was quite a sort of fanciful and far-fetched scenario, but the commission being the commission said, ah, if it's, a, if it's a loophole, we need to fix it. So some bright spark said, ah, well, you've got Article 16. You can, you can uh, write that in there into the regulation. So what they did was they wrote it into a draft regulation that should the circumstances arise where shipments of doses of vaccines are going to Northern Ireland, and then potentially on into Great Britain where they shouldn't be going, then we can we can trigger Article 16. But it was just a provision. But it, of course, it got out that it was in there. And suddenly the EU had triggered uh, Article 16 and uh, all hell broke, broke loose. And it was, it was a really damaging uh, moment. But but the importance of it from this perspective is that um, it was seized on by the, 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 the hard right of the Conservative Party as an excuse to turn back the clock to December 2017, which is when the joint report happened and which was when the whole idea of solving the Northern Ireland problem and the border issue could be dealt with by keeping Northern Ireland aligned to the single market. Um, David Frost, who had taken over from Michael Gove at that point, uh, made no secret of the fact that he thought this was an appalling betrayal by 
Theresa May at the time to, to give in to the uh, beastly uh, European Union and Ireland uh, by, by capitulating in, the, in this way. And they saw the invocation of Article 16 by the Commission as, as, as a crime because the Commission, they said, was, had, had spent years saying you couldn't have any controls on the border, uh, land border north and south. And suddenly here they were putting controls in, blocking um, vaccines from crossing the border, you know, as if there would be mobile European Commission patrols driving along the border looking for doses of vaccines. Um, but whatever way they interpreted it, this was seen as a gift to the hardliners in the Conservative Party to turn back the clock. So initially in, in 2021, whereas it was a case that um, the protocol was being applied too strictly, now it was the protocol itself. And then, of course, we had the the command paper in 2021, July 2021, which didn't set out to fix the protocol, but to replace it completely. And then the commission's response to that was October the 13th, I think, 2021, when they brought out their four proposals for medicines, customs, agri-food and governance. Now, there's a there's a key moment, and this, this all kind of came to light as I was researching this earlier this year, in the light of the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill. If you follow all, da all of David Frost's speeches and appearances before committees, he, he made it clear that, again, it wasn't that the, pro the protocol was being applied too strictly, it was the protocol itself, it, it, it had to be replaced. But in 12 days after the commission came out with its, what it called a generous offer to try and make the protocol more uh, amenable to, to unionists and to businesses, 12 days after those papers came out, David Frost was speaking to the um, European Scrutiny Committee in the House of Commons, and he says, all I will say that is that it is possible that amendments to our own domestic legal order might be necessary to provide total clarity for economic actors in Northern Ireland. Now, from contacts I have in, in Whitehall, I, I, it was made clear to me that they, they were already drafting the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill at that stage. They knew they wanted to have this reta retained EU law bill. This was another kind of Brexiteer wish list, a bonfire of EU regulations that were, that were still uh, enshrined in British domestic law. And in the, uh, in the same legislation that they were started drafting at that time, they would, they would have the, the seeds, the, the, the germination of what we know now is, is a Northern Ireland Protocol bill. Even though Liz Truss had come along in December, January of this year. There was a whole new reset with Mara Shevchevich. There was the meeting in Chevening House in Kent. Everybody was optimistic. And that's why people are somewhat cautious at the moment when talking about resets. Um, already the seeds were being sown for the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill at that time. Um, uh, and really that's where we are at the moment. The, the, the protocol talks, which were spun out of the Commission's response to the joint the, to the command paper last summer, and then the October proposals, um, they ran into the sand in February. Then we had, of course, the the Northern Ireland Assembly elections, and then we've had the standoff ever since. And now we have the resets, the new optimism with Liz Trust. Sorry, uh, Rishi Sunak now being Prime Minister, um, and again, who knows where where this is going to go? But I'll, I'll obviously try and answer that in, in, in the question and answers. But just to say that um, from what I gather, just from talking to contacts this morning, um, Chris Heaton Harris, the Northern Secretary, is going to probably next week say that under the legislation of the new decade, new approach legislation, he's obliged to do X, Y, and Z, and he will try and find some tweak to the legislation that will allow him to defer the elections for for some time so uh, what i predict is that there won't be elections on the 15th of december it'll be delayed because nobody wants an election and most of all for the negotiations it's very difficult to have negotiations if there's an election in the background if there's any breakthrough in the negotiations they will be seized on by the parties and everyone will go into their trenches and therefore we won't um get progress so i'll leave it there and uh 